All right, thank you for joining me today. I listened to this in the gym today, and I, God, it was so exciting. I just said, hey, I have got to share it with you. So we're going to go into it. This is Macro Voices. Uh, I like a lot of their stuff. Um, like everybody, I probably agree with 80% of it or so, but there's some fine details. I'm like, eh, I don't know about that because they're not in the energy industry or real estate industry. They're just looking from a bird's eye macro view. But Luke Groman has got some pretty good stuff to say. So we're going to start with it. I'm going to uh, put it at um, one, one and a half. We'll do 175 because there's. I, want, I don't want this thing to go on forever. I'll probably have to make a second one. But they'll talk a little fast. You can slow it down or I can redo it. Just let me know. But first of all, before we start, thank you for, for, uh, for tuning in. I am trying to grow this channel. So if you do a like and subscribe, maybe share it to a friend who's, who's uh, wondering about what's going to happen in the economy or just disagrees or agrees with you and see what they say about it, that would be great. But. We're going to jump in. We're going to learn about treasuries, a feedback loop that he talks about, and he's going to go into energy and how this is all going to play out or how he hypothesizes it. And you know what? If he hits the ball in the same direction that the field is going or that he calls it, man, that's that's what I'm looking for. There's nobody that's going to be exact, but if they hit it, if they're in the right air, if they get 80% or they're, or they're going in the right direction, they're worth listening to. Forest for the Trees founder, Luke Groman. Luke, it's great to get you back on the show. Feels like it's been too long, although it really hasn't been. I really want to talk to you about the U.S. dollar. Our friend Brent Johnson says he thinks we could get a retest of that, uh, what was it, 115 that we saw on the dollar index. It looks to me like if it got that far, it could go all the way to about 122 or so, which would break a lot of things. Is that a possibility? Are we looking at the potential of the dollar moving even higher than it's been? And if so, what would the consequences be? Yeah, I think it could move that high. And in terms of what would the consequences be, uh, that would break the U.S. Treasury market. That would break Western sovereign debt markets. That would break U.S. banks, Western banking systems. It would accelerate even further de-dollarization of global commodity markets. You know, headline today that China and Brazil just did a deal end to end in Yuan, uh, which would only send the dollar higher, force more deleveraging. So it would break the U.S. dollar system. It's a par- all right, real quick. For those of you that are new to the dollar, um, and what does that mean? Uh, you know, we, especially in America, we buy things in dollars, right? And why it applies to the world in general is a lot of the foreign debt. I think it was. 80% of it or something like that is denominated in dollars. In other words, if you make a, a deal with a company here in America, they're not going to say, hey, we want Chinese yuan or Mexican pesos. They're going to say, hey, we don't, we'll, we'll sell you a product, we'll do whatever for you, but we want you to pay us in dollars. So the contract is denominated in dollars. That means if they're a Mexican company that they make all of their clients give them Mexican pesos, they have to then translate it to dollars in order to pay their debt back, right? Why is this a big deal? Because if the dollar gets stronger, so if the dollar to peso is, um, you know, one dollar equals six pesos, and the dollar gets stronger in relation to other currencies, so one dollar uh, now equals seven pesos. In other words, you have to trade seven pesos for one dollar. All of a sudden, that debt starts to balloon, right? Germany uh, did the reverse of this as they hyperflated their economy to pay off their debt faster. They made their dollar worth nothing and just paid off the you know uh, the debt faster. So what he's saying is if the, the dollar goes stronger, it's going to put pressure on everything. Everything you buy is going to have, um, you're going to need more stuff, less dollars and more stuffs to buy it, right? That's going to put pressure on everything and that's going to create, uh, it's going to crack everything and the economy is going to go down. Foreign and domestic. Most people seem to think that the dollar rising is a sign of the U.S. winning. It's not. It's a sign of the U.S. dollar system unwinding itself. Let's go a little deeper on that. When you say it's a symptom of the U.S. dollar system unwinding itself, obviously, you know, to the casual observer, there's a counterintuitive. You know, you'd think if the system was failing somehow, the dollar would be crashing. How is it that the dollar appreciates? What's the mechanism, and how long does that last? Does it reverse at some point? Um, no, it reverses when the Fed steps in and buys, prints enough money to buy enough treasury bonds. Yeah, but until that point, um, you know, I've been saying on Twitter and, and to clients, the beatings will continue until the dollar is weakened meaningfully and oil prices are dropped meaningfully. So how the right- the dollar is beat down meaningfully and oil prices are. Hold on to that thought. Rising dollar breaks the list of things I laid out is essentially by increasing the net effect of supply nonlinearly. In other words, every tick higher in the dollar forces foreigners to sell more treasuries. They own $7.5 trillion in treasuries, $3.8 trillion at the central bank level, most of which is longer duration treasury. So as the dollar rises, their cost of off- servicing offshore dollar debt rises. They need to sell something to defend their currency, to raise dollars, to service dollar debt. Uh, and so what do they sell? They sell what they can, not necessarily what they want to. They sell treasuries. All right. So what's a treasury? We're going to go over some basics here. Treasury is basically you give money to the U.S. government, and the U.S. government says, hey, we're going to give you that much money back plus an interest rate. So you give them 100 if they if the treasury rate is 5% like it is now. You give them 100000 for however long, and they say, hey, we're going to give you $100,000 and $105,000 back, right? So these, these debt bonds can go for anywhere from one month to three months to one year, two years, all the way up to 30 years, right? Other nations buy these 
um, treasury bonds. They're, they're, big, they're the largest purchaser of treasury bonds, actually. And what they'll do is if their currency is going down, they'll buy treasury bonds to kind of hedge their debts and stuff. What Luke is talking about is, hey, if they're running out of debt and they're running out of ways to pay uh, because all of a sudden, hey, it was when I entered this contract, it was six pesos to the dollar. Now it's seven, inching up to seven and a half, and I have a million dollars to pay back. That's a big, that, that, that's a big, um, that's a big difference, right? So what do they do? Instead of using that 5% or, or that yield to pay it back, they're saying, hey, we're just going to sell the whole treasury bond and I'm going to get back my 100000 and, and whoever takes it can get the rest of it, right? Um, we're going to sell it back sometimes to the U.S. government because we're going to get that 100000 back now to help us pay our debt in dollars and help us pay our dollar-denominated debt back. What does this do to treasury bonds? Treasury bonds have this relationship, right, where if... The uh, the value of the treasury bond is is high. The interest rate is low, and vice versa. So as the value of treasury bonds go down, in other words, you bought it for a hundred thousand, right? When it was like at a, a two percent interest rate, and now it's down to eighty, and it's yielding five and a half percent interest rate, right? When you sell it, you take a haircut. Okay, the best time to buy treasury bonds is when interest rates are high and um, Treasury bonds are low. Like now is a a decent time, not, not financial advice at all, but a decent time I would say to, in comparison to the last ten years, to buy a treasury bond, right? But sometimes when they sell those, they're going to take a haircut or a loss on it, right? Because the the bond has has lowered its value, and so that kind of perpetuates the uh, uh, things breaking, debt rising, and value getting sucked out of the system. So that adds to what is already a very problematic supply demand dynamic in terms of the U.S. running a two point, you know, trailing 12 month deficit is about eight and a half percent to short of eight and a half percent of GDP. Every tick higher in the dollar increases treasury supplies. Then as the dollar goes higher and as foreigners sell more treasuries, that sends rates up, which then feeds back into the dollar, which then feeds back into treasury sales, which sends rates up, which then feeds back into the dollar, which sends rates up. And so we're seeing we are living that feedback loop right now. And then where it starts to get really nasty, uh, if that's not nasty enough already, is U.S. banks own $4.1 trillion in U.S. treasuries and agency mortgages. Uh, they've sold down from call it $4.6 trillion to $4.1 trillion over the last 18 months. Uh, as rates go up, they start to have credit losses. Way back in 2014, some of these treasuries were taken on by the banks as high-quality liquid assets to sell, that they could sell because treasury markets are the, the deepest and most liquid market in the world, trademark U.S. Treasury 1985. So they turned seller. And of course, they're kind of stuck on one level because if they sell, they got to take the marks of the loss that they've already lost money on treasuries. But they need to sell something because commercial real estate's getting worse as rates go up. Credit cards get worse as rates go up. Car loans get worse as rates go up, et cetera, et cetera. So now every tick higher in the dollar drives every tick higher in, in, in yields, which drives the banks to join in in the nonlinear, very convex increase in the net effect of supply of treasuries. And so you can see how this dollar feedback loop will continue. Now, the reason why this is bad for the U.S. is that <laughs> ultimately we're a financialized economy. And uh, you're talking about taking down the treasury market. You're talking about taking down the banks. And you know, I know Brent would say, "Hey, it's also going to take down the Europeans." Yeah, and that's like sort of like you know, the U.S. bombing the U.K. before you know, before Hitler started sending V2 rockets over there and you know, bombing France in 1939 to soften them up for, for Hitler. But importantly, the weaker these nations get, the Japanese uh, again, they are our creditors. They own 18 trillion dollars in U.S. dollar assets on a net basis. They own seven and a half trillion dollars in treasuries on a net basis. As they get weaker, they will sell treasuries faster. And that's why I, I think he's right that you could see this feedback loop. There's really no limit on where the dollar could go. I think the very perception is this, you know, at DXY 200 or 250. 50, paradoxically, you're going to have, you know, oil shortages or gasoline shortages throughout the United States because global supply chains have broken down, which is, I think, a very counterintuitive thought. That's how I'm thinking about it. Let's talk a little bit more about the policy that got us here and maybe where that policy is headed, because it seems to me that as rates were starting to back up, people said, okay, look at interest rates. Oh my gosh, how far is this going to go? And the answer was the Fed's going to keep hiking rates in order to fight inflation until they break something. Then Silicon Valley Bank happened and a whole bunch of people said, okay, shoot, this has got to be it. They broke something. They broke something really big because it was those backing up rates that put so much pressure on Silicon Valley Bank and other banks that failed around the same time. Well, surely that means that they have to pivot now. They've got to go dovish. And almost everybody thought that had to be the last hike because of Silicon Valley Bank. In reality, what it meant to the Fed, I think, was, hmm, that Silicon Valley Bank thing was a big deal. We should pause for a good solid month or so before we hike rates again. And, you know, they didn't stop them from continuing. It seems to me like inflation is not going away. Is the Fed going to continue to hike until they break something much bigger? And how big of something has to break before they're satisfied they've broken something? This is a challenge of, of what they have done, particularly when married with what the Biden administration did with SPR releases last year. SPR releases plus aggressive Fed rate hikes were functionally oil price controls. And Eric, you and I both know price controls work in the short run. They do. And then they make the problem a whole lot worse. Because what you do is send a false signal for a brief period of time to the markets, and so the market stops growing supplies based on the price cap. And so then, all of a sudden, you get this surprise at the back end of, oh my God, why are prices rising even faster now? This doesn't make sense. Well, of course it makes sense. And so what the United States did last year in response to the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine was effectively institute price controls on oil, which is a really good idea if you are not the world's biggest marginal high-cost oil producer whose decline rate of shale is anywhere from five to 10 times the natural decline rate of Russian and Saudi oil, which of course is exactly what is true. So I think... The Fed did not give any thought 
to what rate hikes would do in terms of acting as an artificial price control on U.S. shale production. And now we're on the back end of it. I think the gambit was, hey, we're going to break Russia and we'll break China with rate hikes and oil price caps, and it'll be just like it always is. And the problem, of course, is that <laughs> they ran the old same old playbook with a completely different set of circumstances. And so what we're starting to see is oil prices pick back up. Well, why is that happening? Well, so I I like his what he's going on here, but I think there's more to it than just that. I think it's also the current administration putting. Um, uh, pressure on banks not to lend, right? So you, you have an, uh, a pullback of lending, and if lending is um, is done, it's at a higher interest rate, right? So he's like, hey, you know, this interest rates really affect oil production, and they really do, because the biggest part of oil, uh, especially shale, is to uh, get in the ground and pull it out, and when you start pulling it out that first three to four months, maybe six months, some of your some rigs break even. They pull out so much, right? And then they can recycle that and go put it in there. So getting a loan to start that, getting funding to start that, that's huge in the oil industry. Like we're even seeing, we're even guesstimating that later this year we're going to see some opportunities for drilling, which has a really good tax um, discount to it. But I'll I'll let them finish. <clears throat> you know, as I've warned over and over and over, ninety percent of global oil production growth over the last ten years, according to Enveris and Go Rosen, during Rosen's way, came from U.S. shale. And so what the Fed did with rate hikes, in, because shale is, is interest rate sensitive and has a higher decline rate than Russian oil or Saudi oil, and what the White House did with SPR releases, as aggressive as they've been in 40 or 45 years, was to put a bullet in the growth of U.S. shale production. It's rolling over now. Deeper the EIA. No, no, wait a minute. Look, I definitely agree with you that there is a much steeper decline rate on any given U.S. shale oil rig as opposed to the, the conventional plays that you see in the Middle East. But in terms of total production, uh, remarkably, in, in the wake of the pandemic, the U.S. shale patch has recovered almost completely back to it, it almost new all-time highs. EIA is still reporting, I think, 12.9 million barrels versus 13.3 was the previous record. But there are other reports that are already indicating that U.S. shale, in terms of total production, not, not individual wells depleting, but total production, is right back up there with where it was pre-pandemic. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And And... Rig count is not, as you know, and production follows rig count on a lag of call it whatever three, six, nine months. It's probably more like six to nine months. And rig count started rolling over, I think, late last year. It's it's starting to maybe bottom out now. And and critically, the EIA pointed out for October, Permian's down. Production of Permian's down uh, in September. All right, so there's a lot to unpack there. I'm going to do it really quickly. So uh, I'm not going to be in any particular order. But uh, they talked about. Um production, you know, it's like 12 and, and change and, and 13 was the very top and that's true. And we're doing it with actually with, with less wells and rigs, right? Um, the reason is technology. Technology has gotten better. The average oil well pulls somewhere around 3,000 barrels a month, give or take. Um, we're seeing new ones pull about six, give or take. And it was like, we just stand back and are like, wow, wow, that is amazing. Because technology has brought us that much farther. Right, so we are doing uh, more with the oil and gas industry is doing more with less. Now, that technology comes at a price, but you know it is obviously worth it. Um, he talks about shale is, is uh, uh, the, the, the decline. Yes, shale does decline. That's why we need to punch more holes in the ground, like all oil does. Um, I, I've never looked at the the, the uh, declination curves of um, of Saudi or or Russia. Um, I don't really know how much to trust them per se either because those the, the info coming out of those countries is not as uh, clean as ours, if you get my drift. Um, also, I don't know the the impact of, of offshore. I know offshore is very risky, but man, does it pay off when it hits really, really well, right? So offshore is definitely a good play. But again, the administration is putting uh, the kibosh on a lot of that stuff. So it is just not happening. There's one other item he, he, he mentioned that that's just is looting my mind at the moment. But um, yeah. Oh, he talked about the rig count. Yeah, rig count's important. So rigs drill wells, which then give more oil ore to owners of minerals like myself, and maybe if you're a partner on this, listening to this, it gives us uh, more income as well. So if there are less rigs, right, that means they're producing less wells, which Wells produce the majority of their oil in the first three to four months. Um, to keep up with that, you know, 13 million, or to get up to that 13 million barrels a day, you had to put in a lot, new, a lot more new wells, and we're just not doing that right now. They're putting rigs down, especially in Permian. Permian's going through a growth phase um, to where it's um, it's constricting, and then it's going to just pop because I've gotten sources that have told me there are a lot of new, brand new rigs just sitting in, in yards right now, just waiting. And so they're going to find homes pretty darn soon with oil coming up at $90 a barrel. So that's like, that's, that's the big mother right there. And that has been much slower declining than all the others. All the others are, that's you know, the Permian's the only one of the big four that is, that is set new highs post pandemic. All the others aren't even close in terms of their pre pandemic production, you know, Niobrara, Eagleford and, and Bakken. So we're seeing it all over. The point is, is that what the U S did with oil price caps is now bouncing. It's now boomeranging back like price controls always do. And that is in turn reverberating into the inflationary impulse. And that is in turn reverberating back into the treasury market. So 
that in turn is reverberating back into the dollar. There's there's this feedback loop that is. Okay, so what's the loop he's talking about is um, they're they're trying to stop inflation, right? You can stop inflation by raising the price of cash to dissuade people to um, to buy, um, but that that's on the uh, demand side, right? But on the supply side. Energy has a huge push on that because high energy prices raise the price of everything, right? So it's inflationary in that sense to where it's not because people are buying more. It's because the cost of goods to produce, to manufacture, to ship, to everything goes up, right? Um, I was even talking to a guy in, in, in plastics the other day, and he was telling us that, hey, when oil is high, um, our prices for plastics are low and vice versa. When oil is low, our price for plastics are are quite high. Um, and so, uh, well, that really makes sense. Scratch that part. Um, but my point is, uh, to get everything to market, everything, it costs more when energy goes up, right? And so, um, that is the, the uh, not supply side, but that's the uh, demand side, inflation going up. So, how are they going to beat it? Well, they got to beat through it because there's no way to the Fed can do anything to oil, right? They have to go through the economy to get to oil, um, and then uh, and then that will short that will make oil fall. But what we're doing is we're entering a phase that's we haven't seen before, and this is why I think energy, especially oil and gas, is going to go is is just starting its super cycle because. Um, Let's say the Fed lower, like just beats the economy down and it goes down. Well, we still have a really big shortage of oil and, and pulling oil out of the ground, right? So oil may fall 50%, but if it's at $150 a barrel, 50% is going back down to 75 That is not cheap oil. So I think things are just going to be trucking on and on and on for oil for, for quite some time. Just It is feeding back on itself in multiple ways. And the higher oil goes, the more treasuries foreigners have to sell to get dollars to buy oil. There we go. And so it was a... The price controls the U.S. put on oil last year were very penny-wise pound foolish, and they're now feeding back in two ways, the bounce in oil and, and, and inflation by extension and the treasury market, and that feeds back into the dollar. So it is um, – and that's not – to be clear, that's not to say U.S. oil production can't grow. What it is saying is for U.S. oil production to grow will require a much higher price of oil, and that much higher price of oil over time will increase inflation, which will increase treasury selling, and which will increase rates, which will increase the dollar until you get this break we talked about, which is the fundamental mismatch is the price of oil you need to keep U.S. shale growing. Will break the treasury market. It generates an inflation rate that breaks the treasury market, and that's fine if you're Volcker in you know 1981 and U.S. debt to GDP is 25, 30 percent, and U.S. deficits are two percent of GDP. But U.S. debt to GDP is 120, and entitlements are cash flow negative, and deficits are eight and a half percent of GDP. So there's simply the supply is so much higher. Like we can't afford the rate of inflation we need to keep shale growing. It's this fundamental mismatch that is contributing to and accelerating this feedback loop in the treasury market, the dollar. That there's there's no breaks on this thing. I agree with you in principle, I and mean, in theory, that, that makes perfect sense to me. What I'm having trouble digesting, though, is how is it that the shale patch has done such an amazing job of recovering from the pandemic? A lot of experts said, oh, look, you know, the, the only way they ever got to 13.3 million barrels was a mountain of easy money from the Fed in the wake of, of the, you know, 2009 event and so forth. It's it's never going to happen again. Well, it has happened again. Against all odds, they're, they're back to, you know, these incredible production levels. Um, how How is it possible that we're managing to produce all of this oil, and how much longer can we continue to grow it? At the end of the day, the answer is price, right? Oil went to 120 last year in March when Russia invaded. Um, and then we got priced down and recount rolled over. And so, you know, there's a lag on the production. There's been an element where there have been much longer laterals, right? You've seen a record in, in terms of, you know, the laterals that they've been using. But you can see the productivity numbers are starting to roll over. You can see production in Permian is starting to roll over. And so, again, it's a function of price. But critically, the oil price needed to do what they did is fundamentally incompatible with a with $2 trillion deficits and 120% debt to GDP and the DXY at 107. Like those, those you, you can't have all of those things at once. The release valve will be dollar up, treasury market up, feedback loop, unless the Fed steps in and stops that feedback loop. Moving on from oil, let's talk about some of the other consequences of that feedback loop. You know, some of the predictions that we've heard over the years were a bunch of bloggers that were saying, you know, someday China and Russia are going to divest their U.S. Treasury holdings. And when they do, look this out, baby, because really it's going to crash the market. You know, there's going to be martial law in the United States. The world, the sky's falling and so forth. Well, the crazy thing is the prediction came true. The China and Russia did divest much of their Treasury holdings, but no such thing happened. It was a complete false alarm. The, the next prediction, though, was, boy, if we ever got back to 5% Treasury rates, that would push the U.S. cost of borrowing so high and so far beyond tax receipts that you would have an abject fiscal crisis in the United States starting the next morning after, you know, Treasury yields managed to hit 5 well, guess what? We've had quite a few next mornings after Treasury yields hit 5%. Those things haven't quite happened yet, although I'm not sure that, that they're not in the works. What do you see in terms of things actually breaking? Are, are there leaks in the dam yet? And where do you expect them to start springing up if not? Oh, my goodness. The leak started a year ago. Um, you know, when the UK guilt market broke, that was a leak. What was the US response to that? You know, Janet Yellen ran down the TGA at a record amount, uh, injecting massive dollar liquidity into the system, completely more than offset Fed QT for over a quarter, or for certainly for most of a quarter. Uh, and the dollar weakened about 15% in four months, which is an enormous decline. That was you know September last year, so five months after the Fed, six months after the Fed really started getting aggressive. Uh, it didn't take long. The next leak was you know, Signature Valley Bank. Like these, these bank problems were not bank problems. They were Treasury market problems. The Fed had the choice of saying, no, you know what? 
we're not going to do BTFP. We will not do swaps where we'll swap you dollars at par on treasuries that are down 30%. Sell them. We told you to hold those as HQLA when you ran into trouble. And now you're in trouble. Sell them. And what would have happened? The banks would have sold into what was a very sloppy market. You could see it. The move index, the treasury volatility index in March was at 160. The banks would have sold. That would have driven. Basically, the treasury move we're seeing right now, the yield up every day, you know, 10 year up, 10 basis points every day, that would have happened in March. So that was sort of leak two. 2Q, you basically had no issuance because of the debt ceiling. And that made things seem like it was okay, better than it was. And 3Q, like here we are. And so, you know, when you say, hey, Russia, China, they, they, you know, if they sell the pressure treasury market, anyone that would have said that would have, that's, that's misunderstanding some various fundamentals and misunderstanding what happened and understanding the path, right? So what do I mean by that? I mean, China and Russia did sell and nothing happened. Why did nothing happen? Well, you can look back in time. In 2014, banks were regulated into buying treasuries. 2015, money market funds were regulated into buying treasuries. 2017, under Trump, pensions were regulated or incented by a tax breaks into buying treasuries. And, and so, you know, banks, they went from owning a trillion eight in, in treasuries and agencies in 2014 to 4.6 by 2021. Money market funds, they're, they're, they're owning of government, you know, T-bills. You know, the, the... All right, I'm going to pause it right here because it's kind of going on the, uh, a tangent with T-bills. But the important thing is this, uh, as he wraps up that, uh, there's a circular thing to where basically uh, treasury, the bond market, which controls everything, uh, treasuries are going to be lowered in value, the interest rates are going to go up, that's going to hit the economy really hard, and at the same time, oil prices are going to go up. I'm going to make another video showing uh, where the charts say and everything to where they're going, and, and he's right, they both show the charts going up. Uh, spoiler alert, it looks like the DXY is going to hit pretty hard in um, in December, and oil is going to hit hit 120 sometime in March or uh, to May of next year. So, um, yeah, so this is probably the first one. Let me go to the next one because the what he says right over here is going to be amazing well. But the point is this, buckle up because it's going to be, we're in for some hard times economically, right? And uh, energy is going to be high, and so I and my partners are going to be doing amazingly well during this hard time when everyone else is struggling. I hate to put it that way, but uh, I'm happy where I'm positioned, uh, and my plan is to take advantage of that. And when everything else is low, assets are um, struggling and sluggish, and the prices have fallen, I'm going to take advantage of that and buy them all up. If any of this interests you, you want more information, uh, just give me a, uh, just reach out to me. You got my email at the bottom, and we will talk.